Dr. Zaihan. Good yeah. afternoon. How is life going? <laughs> good afternoon. I'm good. What about you? Yes, I'm good too. It's okay. <laughs> Everything will be fine here. Okay, all right. But it's, uh, it's just one, what you call, one bad news. Oh. My dean got sick due to uh, pandemic this one. Oh, okay. Okay, but so the uh, vice dean on behalf of my dean will give speech here. I see. Okay. okay. All right. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Professor Effendi, should I call you? Effendi, just Effendi. Okay. Okay. Dr. Effendi is vice dean of uh, uh, research, uh, research, affair. And... research affair, research and collaboration affair. Yeah. I just want uh, Dr. Rimayanti, uh, on behalf of my dean, will give speech here. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Rosaihan. Um, How are you? <laughs> How are you? Apa kabar? Apa kabar, Dr. Rosaihan? Sehat ya? Sehat? Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So everything is online? Your teaching is just online now? Yes, yes, uh, online. Managed by we call Aula system here. We we have e-learning system in uh, uh, Erlangga University, uh, Dr. Saihan. So all of the teaching learning process in uh, uh, we need uh, the e-learning system here. So one hundred percent online. One hundred percent online. Yes. Yeah, except uh, practical. Uh, related with the core competence of uh, veterinarian should be do by offline this one mm. same goes with upm so we, we oh. are right now 100% online good it's really good <laughs> to protect uh, our student from this kind of pandemic yeah? yeah yeah so right now in malaysia we have lockdown yeah 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 i heard about it yeah it's really bad yeah that's why everything needs to be online. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Raihan, I wear this one. What do you call in Malaysia? Kopia, yeah, this one? Uh, songko. Songko. Ah, songko, yeah. In Indonesia, songko. we call kopia. 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 No, Indonesia is songko. Huh? Songko. 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 Kupia, yes. Pak Dadi, we call Kupia, not Sungku. Sungku is no. Malay. No, Indonesian, the we Javale do is Songko. We do have Kopia as well, but the Kopia is usually white in color. Oh, Kopia white color? White color. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Next, next, uh, next uh, event, I wear uh, Kopia with white color. <laughs> because I did my heart uh, pilgrim. Good, good. Okay, okay. <laughs> red color. Okay, That's Malaysian good. style. Red color. Uh, we can wear both songko, like white Dr. Effendi is wearing songko. So we also have the white color. Oh, okay. Kopia. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I have to. Songko and Kopia. Okay. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to all the participants. The Honorable Vice Dean Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Airlangga, Dr. Mayanti, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, Master of Health, and Dr. Mustafa Helme Effendi, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, Diploma on Tropical Animal and Public Health. The Honorable our guest lecturer. Dr. Rosa Yehan Mansur from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University Putra, Malaysia. The Honorable all lecturers and all the participants of this event. 
first of all, uh, let us pray and praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because His bless and mercy, we can come together without any obstacle, with health and condition, uh, with healthy condition in this event. I'm very pleased to see you here, and it is our pleasure to welcome you to our lecture, uh, publicly organized by the Division of Veterinary Public Health, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Erlangga. My name is Dian Ayu Permatasari, the Master of Ceremony of the Peace uh, My name is Dian Roman. Before we start the event, we share the agenda of this event. We have several agendas are as follows. The first agenda is opening remark from the head of the Division of Veterinary Public Health, Dr. Bradley Ahadjo, Veterinary Medicine Master of Health. The second agenda is opening speech from the Vice Dean of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Airlangga, Dr. Rimayanti, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, Master of Health. The third agenda is presentation from the speaker, Dr. Rozaihan Mansor. The third agenda are the awarding. The participants ask questions through the chat column Zoom and live YouTube, or delivered directly by using the hand button during the question and answer session. And the last agenda is closing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start this agenda by praying according the respective religion and belief. Okay, let's pray together first. Pray, begin. Pray, finish. Thank you very much. And the next agenda is opening remark that will be delivered by Dr. Dabira Harjo, Dr. Uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, Master of Health, as a head of Division Veterinary Public Health. To Dr. Dadi, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the time. So, Honorable Case Lecture, Dr. Rosaihan Mansor, dan yang terhormat Dr. Rimayanti, yang terhormat Dr. Helmi Mustafa Helmi Effendi, yang terhormat para partisipan semuanya yang telah meluangkan waktu untuk join pada acara. So I will introduce myself to especially uh, Dr. Rosaihan. Mansur is my position is replaced to Dr. Helmi. Change in Indonesia, we always the uh, uh, department or division head division is Dr. Mustafa Helmi. So I think for him only. So for Dr. Rosayan Mansur, thank you very much for your kind and time to join in our uh, schedule about the guest lecture on the title is usage and resistance of antibiotic in the dairy cattle and we hope this we hope we, we have to increase our knowledge we hope increase our call what the main collaboration with um, Dr. Rosayan Mansur, also with UPM, also with Malaysian, with join how to solve our many problem about the antibiotic resistance. Indonesia also have the big problem and start in 2018. We stop use the antibiotic group promoter in chicken, but now I think we we move about how use this antibiotic in in the dairy cattle because the resistant in dairy cattle not only affect of the animal but also affect of human as food safety also uh, and microbial resistant and now have the big attention with WSO. So I think that's my speed. 
thank you very much and once again thank you very much for Dr. Rosa Ihan Mansur to help us to join in this as a guest lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gadi. So the next agenda, which is opening speech from Vice Dean of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Rimayanti, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, Master of Health. To Dr. Rimayanti, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dian. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome Honorable Vice Dean, Dr. Mustafa Helmi Effendi, um, as well as welcome to our Honorable Dakota guest lecturer today, Dr. Rozai Han Mansur from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University Putra Malaysia. Dr. Rozai Han, welcome in the virtual classroom of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, Surabaya, Indonesia. So also welcome to the head division of Veterinary Public Health, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Dadi Raharjo. I would like to welcome all, uh, all of uh, our honorable lecturers and students of the Director of Veterinary Medicine Profession Program, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, who might be the guest lecture in this afternoon. And also welcome to the students of Dr. Rozai Han Mansur from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Malaysia, who attend this lecture today. I would like to thank all participants who have joined the guest lecture today to the virtual classroom of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Alangka. So ladies and gentlemen, today we attend guest lecture. It's about anti anti microbial disease and resistance in dairy cattle through the Kota program of Universitas Elanga. The Kota is in for a video conferencing with Universitas Elanga that invites international academics to deliver online course, online guest lecture. A writing clinic and seminar class. So there is a blessing in this case, in this pandemic situation, because uh, make it easier to us to attend the meeting online through the boundaries of space and time, even though uh, this lecture and transfer knowledge are given online. Hopefully, all of us can obtain great knowledge on uh, this. I would like to thank the Division of Veterinary Public Health. Of Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Elanga, chaired by Dr. Dadi Raharjo, and all of the lecturers in the division for organizing this event. And of course, many special thanks to our speaker today, Dr. Rozai Han Mansur from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Malaysia, for delivering such important topic so that all of us can deepen our knowledge. We really appreciate that, Dr. Rosai Han. So finally, I hope this program will be fruitful for all of us, and thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Rimayanti. Uh, so uh, we come to the third agenda. It's the main agenda which are waiting for. Uh, presentation from the speaker. For the presentation session, we'll be guided by our moderator, Dr. Dadi Raharjo, Dr. Veterinary Medicine, Master of Health. And before we start the presentation session, uh, I would like to read briefly about the curriculum PIT of Dr. Dadi. So Dr. Dadi is one of the lecturer in Division of Veterinary Public Health. Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Airlangga. He was born in Kediri, September 15, 1961. And in 1986, 
He has received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universitas Airlangga. And in 2000, he got his Master of Health in Universitas Airlangga. And in 2012, he has received his doctoral program in Universitas Airlangga. For publication, he has published 19 papers, Corpus Index, and his research area is on veterinary public health. Okay, that is the curriculum vitae for from Dr. Dadi. And please welcome to Dr. Dadi. So thank you very much for your time. So I would like to invite Dr. Rusayan Mansur to join. Then uh, can you give me the Curriculum vitae of the Rosayan Mansur. Sorry, I'm not fine yet. I think I remember. Dr. Rosayan Mansur is lecturer and veterinary, faculty of veterinary medicine, University of Putra, Malaysia, and have 20 or something, or sorry, I missed, 20 publication in the Scopus Index. And then that's PhD in College of Medical Veterinary and Life Science Graduate School of the University of Glasgow, United Kingdom. And then Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Putra, Malaysia. Then the research area is Ruminan Medicine. So welcome to the Rosayan Mansur who to uh, join in this session and please time for yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Datik. Uh, I think I will share the screen now. Okay, uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, to Dr. Adiana uh, for her suggestion in having me uh, as um, the invited uh, get, uh, guest le uh, lecturer for this uh, Dikota lecture series. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, to Dr. Dadik. Uh, and I, I guess that the dean is not here. Uh, and then we have, uh, yeah, uh, and everyone's attending to uh, today's lecture. So uh, for this lecture, I'll be talking into two parts here. Uh, in which that the first part will be on the AMR, uh, on the antimicrobial resistance. And then the second part will be on the mastitis because we know that mastitis um, is actually one of the diseases, a very important diseases in dairy cattle, which consume uh, much of the antibiotics uh, in the dairy cattle production. So yeah, uh, my name is Rosai Han. So I'm from the University of Putra, Malaysia, uh, specializing in ruminant medicine. So I'm sure that many of you are aware of this poster here. Have you seen this? So this is actually a sustainable development goals, uh, which is actually developed by the United Nations. So they've come out with these goals. There are 17 of them into, uh, I think in 2015, um, um, in which that they are focusing more in the field of ecology, in the field of education, healthcare, uh, societal changes. So this, all of these uh, 17 um, SDGs, we call this as SDGs, are inter interrelated. So they are actually interrelated. Although AMR or antimicrobial resistance is not spelled out clearly, however, it falls under, of course, it falls under uh, which one here? The good health and well being. However, if we were to look at the number one, number two, or even reduce inequalities number 10. So these are all interrelated. So we know that AMR is a very uh, important uh, global threat, okay? And with the rise of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, so it has been more severe um, because people are actually in the ICU intensive care units. Uh, they are, people are having like um, a very severe infection. So we know that antibiotics have been administered to these patients, especially in the ICU. And in, within this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, 
it is known that azithromycin, one of the antibiotics, uh, is known to have a potent anti-inflammatory in the lung tissues, especially given to patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, and bear in mind as well, uh, as happened in India, uh, the use of other antimicrobial agents, not antibiotics, such as ivermectin. We know that ivermectin mm -hmm. is very anthelmintic. So ivermectin has also been administered to COVID-19 patients. So we know that this is a very important issue. Um, Next up, we know that this, uh, so this is just to simplify showing that the goal number one, goal number two here is interrelated, okay? Um, because we know that um, um, in, in, in due to the increasing in the global population, the economic growth and developments. So it is expected that the growth of food production uh, would also be increased up to 70%. Um, and due to this, it is also expected that the uh, increase or rise on the antimicrobial consumption will be also increased in parallel with the increase in the food production. Uh, just to, 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 to make sure that we are able to fit uh, the increasing on the global um, uh, human population. Uh, and if we were to talk about the global, uh, the SDG number eight here on the decent work and economic growth, so if we were to talk about people getting infected with multi-drug resistant infection, so these patients, they have a very um, difficulties in, 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 in um, uh, we, we have difficulties in treating these patients here. Uh, so this would affect their opportunities to find employment. So these people, these patients, um, after being treated with uh, many kinds of antibiotics, so the adverse outcome would be, uh, they would perform very poorly at the workplace. Uh, and we know that uh, people living in the least developing countries, pe uh, people living in a poverty, so they will have um, problems in getting uh, drugs. They don't have money to buy drugs. So what happened is that they would be uh, looking for antibiotics. Uh, they would be looking for the, um, uh, they would self-medicating themselves with antibiotics in which that this is not a very good uh, practice. And the last one is the goal number 10 here, the reduce inequality, meaning that if the patients, um, they don't have access to uh, expensive medications and they are self-medicating themselves with the antibiotics. So this would be directly worsen the societal inequalities. So it is hoped that, even though it is not listed here, it is hoped that uh, with the uh, global number six here, uh, hold on, global number six, I'm sorry, I cannot go back. So global, uh, uh, goal number six is actually in clean water and sanitation. So it is hoped that if we comply to have more clean water uh, with a better sanitation. So we, we, we hope that we would able to reduce the infection because more than 200 diseases are actually coming from the contaminated water. All right, so it is often, it is usually inter, interconnected within this SDG, uh, with these 17 SDGs. So this poster here from the WHO, just to show you um, how um, AMR um, is very, important global threat uh, affecting both um, animals and uh, human population. So we know that we depend 100%, I mean, most of the time with antimicrobials and antimicrobials are being used both in human as well as in the animals. So if there is actually a presence of drug resistance bacteria here affecting, uh, infecting the animals, uh, so it can also be spread to the environment and because of poor sanitation, uh, there is not enough uh, good uh, farm practice. So these drug resistant bacteria will be able to be transferred to the food. So if we consume food that is not properly cooked, for example, so it can also be transmitted through eating here. All right. So if these people here is getting sick, okay, they succumb with this um, infection caused by this multi-resistant, multi-drug resistant bacteria. So this patient here is having problems uh, in, in treating, uh, difficult to treat um, uh, from uh, um, bacteria um, 
uh, resistant bacteria causing this infection. So we can actually see how important it is being interconnected between the animals as well as in the human. All right, so types of antibiotics, we know that antibiotics is one of the important drugs, okay? Uh, being uh, able to either kill the bacteria uh, or it can actually inhibit the growth of bacteria. So it can be into two types, bactericidal or it can be bacteriostatic. So these are all the examples of the bactericidal antibiotics such as aminoglycoside, uh, beta-lactam, um, and these are the examples of the bacteriostatic which inhibit only the growth of the bacteria such as uh, glycyl, cycline, lincosomides and the rest. So we know that antibiotics has started to fail. We have observed that the golden, of era, golden era of antibiotics, which happened, I think, right after the, uh, the, 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 the World War II. So Sir Alexander Fleming has discovered this penicillin in 1928. And from there, uh, uh, um, it has been uh, such a great, a tremendous journey of uh, discovery of new antibiotics. However, we have started, so it started with, between 1940s up to early 1970s. However, um, the discovery rate of the new antibiotics started to reduce uh, from 1980s onwards. So why is this happening? So as you can actually see here from the graph, it started to decline up to 2012, only like perhaps less than eight of new antibiotics being developed. So why is this happening? So this happened because the lack of interest from the government, from the pharmaceutical companies in, in investing uh, in the research of uh, new antibiotics because of the low uh, return of investment. So that's why they stopped producing, uh, focusing research on uh, developing new antibiotics. And at the same time, because there's not much of the, not, not many of the new antibiotics being produced, at the same time, there's actually uh, the emergence of the resistant bacteria uh, because of the misuse of antibiotics. So this has happened both in human as well as in, in animal. So what would worsen the condition is that the ability of the um, resistant bacteria found in animals are able to transfer to human. Um, I'm just giving you guys like the um, extra terminologies which often being used when we describe as antimicrobial, such as the MRL, which is the maximum residue level and also the withdrawal period. Um, so when we talk about MRL is actually how much of the, the maximum level of antibiotics or drugs residue that should be able to contain in the food products. Okay, so this is, this should be an acceptable level. Uh, which poses no toxicological hazard health effect to humans, okay? Uh, with the withdrawal period, this is actually the time between the last dose of the antibiotics given to the animal um, and different drugs, they would have a different withdrawal period depending on the chemical, depending on the physical properties of the antibiotic and also the route of administration. So you have to make sure that so that um, before we slaughter the animal, so we can actually make sure that the level of antibiotic residues will be at the very minimum level. So what will be the status of AMR globally? Um, this is another terminology, which I think is very important for us to know, uh, which is actually the multi-drug resistant bacteria or MDR. So bacteria, uh, MDR bacteria is actually bacteria which are resistant to three, or more different antibiotics group. And then we have the extensively drug resistant bacteria or XDR, which this bacteria only is susceptible to only two remaining agents. So we can actually see that this bacteria is, is something that is very uh, uh, crucial. Uh, and we do have pen drug uh, resistant or totally drug resistant bacteria, PDR or TDR bacteria. So this type of bacteria this, the, no antibiotics is going to work on this bacteria, all right? Um, so WHO or even CDC of the US, uh, so they have come out with this list of pathogen. We call this as escape pathogens. I'm not really sure if you guys have heard about this. So, I mean, these are the list of the uh, pathogens. So under this escape here, 
this has become like a very crucial um, bacteria that pose a very uh, important threat of AMR because this list of bacteria are known to be a multi-drug resistant. So they are found to be resistant to almost uh, different uh, different kinds of antibiotics. So if you can actually see here, most of these escape pathogens were actually gram-negative bacteria. All right. Uh, and WHO has also listed like a priority bacteria uh, called as the carbapenem resistant bacteria, which can include Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, there's also Acinetobacter uh, baumani, um, and also I think Enterobacteriaceae. Okay. And we also have this multi-drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. So these are all the bacteria that listed like the highest priority under the WHO. Um, and they have put, um, and as, as they listed all these kind of bacteria, so they, they are aware that um, research and development uh, on producing new antibiotics against this gram-negative bacteria is very crucial, okay, because this, list of bacteria, they are able, um, they, they have this capability to, uh, to, to transmit, or they have this pathogenic potential, especially uh, in the nosocomial environments and uh, as well as in the nursing home. So they, 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 they uh, basically they have put this into priority in terms of the research uh, into finding the new antibiotics. So moving on, on the AMR or antimicrobial resistance. So the definition is simple. So this is when it happens that the bacteria or the antibiotics are no longer being effective to kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. Okay, so somehow the bacteria is able to uh, outgrow uh, the effects of antibiotics. So how does this AMR occur? So we can actually see that this is actually the group of bacteria. So they might have this uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So the, the, cross, the red cross colored one is actually the sensitive bacteria. So whenever antibiotics is being given here, so antibiotic resistant bacteria is able to, to be there. They are able to survive. As they survive, they are able to grow and also multiply. Not only that, they can also transfer their resistance gene to other, other, uh, other groups of bacteria. So, because of the ability to transfer the genes uh, to other bacteria. So whenever, whenever infection occur, whenever we give treatment with antibiotics, it will no longer work. So they will outgrow, they will try to multiply, they will try to cause severe infections. So this is how the basic of the uh, AMR. So the bacteria itself, it has this, uh, they, 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 they intrinsically, their ability uh, without having the use of, um, uh, without having um, the, the, the practice of misuse antibiotics, they themselves, the bacteria themselves, are able to, um, um, uh, to, to, to have this um, ability to, um, to be resistant uh, against, uh, against antibiotics. So they have uh, several mechanisms here, as listed in this diagram here. So they, they, they might uh, develop new cell processes, which whenever the antibiotic comes into contact, so they are not able to attach. Or they can um, destroy the antibiotics with the production of enzymes here. So this, this, this one here is, uh, is an enzyme. So whenever the antibiotics come into contact, the enzymes will try to destroy these antibiotics. Or um, they have something on the cell wall, meaning that antibiotic would not be able to come in, would not be able to penetrate into the bacterial cell. Uh, or it can also develop like a pumps. So whenever the antibiotics come into contact, they are trying to pump out the antibiotics. And lastly is because they change the target inside their cells here. So whenever the antibiotics comes, so they will not be able to attach. So it would not be working. So this is how, how smart the bacteria is in surviving themselves against antibiotics. Um, this one here is just to show you how the um, AMR uh, or how the, how the resistant bacteria are being transferred from animals to human. Uh, from, I mean, if, if, if um, the bacteria residing in the GIT or the gastrointestinal of the animals, 
being passed in the feces and through the manure. So this can also be infecting the human. And then from the animals, uh, it can also be transmitted uh, into the meat uh, or milk. So if uh, we consume raw milk, we, we, we eat like uh, uncooked meat, for example, so we can actually still get uh, this uh, resistant bacteria. Okay, so if we get sick, if people get sick, so we will be transferred to the hospital and then from here, nosocomial infections might occur. So we might be passing the resistant bacteria from one human to another human. All right, so this is how complex and how uh, important the issue of AMR here. So we see this as a threat uh, uh, in a one health concept, okay, whereby the people I've mentioned before, uh, the uh, carbapenem resistant bacteria, especially the entero, uh, enterobacteriaceae, which survive in the uh, sink drains at the hospitals and then being spread to other patients and to environment through wastewater. And from animals, uh, we have, for example, Salmonella um, Heidelberg bacteria. So these Salmonella are able to infect both uh, cattle and as well as people. And of course, um, the environment is affected as well. For example, Aspergillus fumigators, although this is not um, uh, what we call this a bacteria, it's a common mold. Uh, it, may, it can actually make people uh, with weak immune system sick. So uh, it has been reported that Aspergillus fumigators has been resistant uh, in 2018, and it has been uh, found in the crop fields treated with fungicides, which are similar to the antifungal use in human medicine. So you can actually see how interrelated this is. All right, so what are the challenges? What We, we have this AMR problem. So how are we going to curb this? Because it affects these three components, human, animals, and uh, as well as environment. So we have come out, even in Malaysia, even in Indonesia, we have come out with this national action plan, um, uh, my AP, we call it in Malaysia, uh, from 2017 to 2021. I'm not really sure in the Indonesia uh, because it stopped until 2019, uh, but I hope that it, that's actually the continuation on the national action plan on AMR. So this, this, when we, when we, the country, develop this NAP, so this is actually to train the health workers. So when we talk about health workers, we are not focusing on the medicine, human medicine doctors as well uh, only. So we are also talking about the veterinarians, uh, uh, the, 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 the support staff, like a veterinary assistant, the medical assistant, on the rational use of medicine. So we are actually trained, even the students, the vet students, the medical students. So we are actually continuously educating them on how to use um, the proper antibiotics. And because we vets or even the medical doctors, we are given the, uh, the, the benefit of uh, giving the prescriptions for the antibiotics. So we should be able to control that, okay? Uh, we have the power to prescribe the antibiotics. So we should be able to uh, know how to control or to contain this uh, AMR problem. And in this NAP, um, there's actually like a campaign, like awareness program for the community, for the public, for the farmers. Um, yeah, I mean the public or even the farmers on how important this problem is. And in this NAP as well, we provide the guidelines for the antibiotic use. So we have uh, like a list of uh, critically important antibiotics listed under WHO. And I guess in OIE as well, we do have like a list of uh, these important antibiotics. So what would be, so we have to make sure that uh, the, the, the prescription or the use of antibiotics should be uh, appropriate and the record use of antibiotics. So this actually, the record use of antibiotics is part of the surveillance system under the country. So I guess both Malaysia and Indonesia, we do have uh, uh, from two parts, uh, the animal and also the human. So we are actually uh, integrating the data on the antimicrobial use in animals, uh, the, in the livestock sector or in the human medicine uh, part. So we are trying to get this data being compiled and then we, 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 we can actually have a better prospect on the uh, status of AMR in each country. So we know um, that the antimicrobial use in livestock, there are three, fun, uh, three objectives, either to treat. If we have sick animals, by all means, 
um i mean okay sick animals can be can be can can it can cause by the viruses or even the bacteria or even the parasites so we as a vet we should know um based on the history based on the clinical science we should be able to list all the uh the 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 the, the, the diseases like a differential of diagnosis and then we can actually determine whether uh, there's a need for us to prescribe antibiotics or not second is actually to prevent diseases so this can be in the form of metaphylaxis or it can be in the form of prophylaxis so the difference between these two is that the metaphylaxis is uh, when uh, you know that the uh, uh, the immediate uh, population of animals are having like an outbreak so we're just giving antibiotics just to make sure that this group of animals doesn't uh, come um, doesn't succumb into this disease. As a prophylaxis, it's just uh, giving antibiotics just to make sure that these animals do not get um, certain diseases. Okay, uh, but this this group of animals they don't show any clinical signs, right? And lastly, to promote animal growth. So most of the time, I think um, yeah, as mentioned by Dr. Dadik just now, that Indonesia has stopped the use of growth promoters in animals, and the same has uh, uh, the same is happening in the Malaysia as well. Uh, but previously, many countries they have integrated these antibiotics in the feed of the animals or in the water of the animals just to promote the growth of the animal, okay, as a growth promoter. So the global trends in the um, antimicrobial use in the food animals. So I'm just showing you, this is, this is actually like a new data. I think um, this paper is from 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Um, however, in dairy, uh, in, at least in um, cattle industry, only 42 milligram per PCU of antimicrobial is being used. Um, the highest is coming from the swine industry uh, worldwide. Uh, and the second would be from the chicken. So in this study, um, they have uh, they, 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 they estimated in 2030, it will be rise from 93,000 tons to 104,000 tons. The increase in the, at 11.5%. Um, a previous study has been done, the similar studies in which that, I think that study was done 2015, if I'm not mistaken. So they projected a higher increase, okay? So later on, we will talk about the why, why, why does it reduce, okay? This, this one here is 104. I think the, the previous study estimated around 120, 20,000 tons increase. Um, and this uh, world map is just showing you uh, the antimicrobial consumption per country uh, in 2017 and also 2030. So as we can see here, okay, the largest, country consuming the antimicrobial is actually China, okay? However, um, things has changed in China. So they are trying to reduce the use of antibiotics. Um, so we, we uh, I mean, in, in this paper, they have cited that, uh, they have said that, they mentioned that the use of an, um, antimicrobial in China has reduced. So that's why the previous study, okay? So it has been reduced. So they estimated in 2030, in nine years time, um, the, 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 it will still be increased. However, the, uh, the amount will be lesser than the previous study. The second, if we were to look at the um, Asian countries, um, the second largest would be here, Thailand. All right, Thailand has listed as the most uh, 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 increased consumption of antibiotics in the Asian countries and of course, uh, Brazil, uh, the US uh, is still uh, top, among the top 10 of countries that consuming more of the uh, antibiotics, meaning that animals, livestock uh, consumption of antibiotics. Okay. So this is just to show you, this is also a recent study. Okay, Indonesia, total livestock population and the use of antimicrobial. So they, 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 uh, they mentioned that um, uh, with the, the total livestock population, the use of anti uh, antimicrobials, about 27% in the poultry farms, um, and uh, around 81% of the farmers routinely give antibiotics as the prophylactic, okay? So we know that as the global human population increase, there's actually increased demand for the food, for the meat, 
et cetera. So we are trying to modernize uh, the animal livestock production. So we, 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 we um, most of the time the production will be intensively. So that's why there's uh, an increase of the antibiotics consumption for this uh, type of uh, intensive system. So it is not surprising uh, to see uh, such a high number. And this is just to show you like the prevalence of um, uh, resistant bacteria. So in Indonesia from, from the poultry, um, there's actually the Enterococcus faecalis, uh, the multi-drug resistant bacteria has been uh, reported um, quite high around 84.5%, okay. So what would be the risk when we use when we talk about the antimicrobial use of livestock, I mean, we as a vet, we, 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 I'm not really sure what would be your, 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 your view on this, but I guess as vets, we are trying to, um, we are not saying that we shouldn't use antibiotics, or, um, I mean, 100%. Antibiotics still can be regarded as an important um, component in, 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 in uh, animal industry, okay? However, um, there's always a risk when using the antibiotics. The first would be the use of critically important antibiotics in human medicine. So in human medicine, they've always say that, you know what, vets are always use this kind of important antibiotics, okay? So we, they, 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 they are saying that we are the, drive, the, the driver of the AM, uh, AMR. So we, we are the one, the culprit, giving antibiotics to our animals, and then there's actually a transfer of this um, MR to humans, okay? So there's always been a debate on the use of important antibiotics in human health. But the problem is with vets, with, with us, is that we tend to use uh, antibiotics unnecessarily as a growth promoters. So meaning that we have this, we know that this drug, they have a dosage, but we use it lower than that. So this is called as a sub-therapeutic dose. So we use it, as a growth promoters. So it, it is also being used as dry therapy in mastitis, or we use it as uh, uh, to, uh, uh, for the coccidiosis, uh, for example, the use of sulfonamides and ionophores, okay? And with that, because we use antibiotics, of course, we have problems in residues, in milk, in meat products, or even in other dairy products. So this is just to show you how much of the uh, amoxicillin residues in milk and even in eggs. Um, and in developing countries, we have a problems in monitoring uh, the, the, the amount of residues. So because we have a poor facilities, so that's why we are not able to monitor how much of residues in the, um, uh, in, in the milk products or the milk uh, or even the dairy products. And of course the transfer of NMR pathogens or even the AMR genes as mentioned before. So this table just to show you the uh, list of um, antibiotics, critically important in human, uh, highly important or even important. So I guess that colistin has been uh, banned in Malaysia. I'm not really sure in the, uh, Indonesia, but yeah, colistin is being, uh, is, uh, I think commonly used uh, to as the growth promoters in swine industry. <coughs> just to give you like, um, uh, an overview of the dairy industry in Indonesia. So most of the uh, uh, the farmers, um, dairy farmers is actually a smallholder farmers. So this is this situation is is just similar similar with Malaysia condition. We we do have uh, many smallholder farmers, about seventy seven percent. So these smallholder farmers they produce less than ten liters per day per head. Right, of course. Uh, however, in twenty last year, uh, there has been an increase about one point one percent of the total dairy consumption. So in Indonesia, uh, there has been um, these are the list of the dairy products that are being exported into Indonesia, and these are the countries of imported uh, dairy products. So like Malaysia is around three like percent here. Okay. Uh, so what about the, the issue, because we are talking about the dairy production here. Of course, antibiotics is being routinely uh, used to treat diseases. That's one thing for sure. Uh, but other than that, it is also being used as the medicated milk replaces among 
the dairy producers. So this is actually also happening. We be, we, we, we fed um, the, we are feeding the dairy calves with medicated milk replacers. So this, this is just to show you whether, I'm not really sure. I mean, even in Malaysia, we don't have organic dairy farms, but I guess in, um, uh, uh, in developed countries, they do have these organic dairy farms. So in organic dairy farms, um, there shouldn't be any use of antibiotics. So if they are not using any antibiotics, so by right, the AMR would be lesser, the, the, the uh, resistant bacteria would be lesser. So several studies have been done. So they, they have found that uh, lower prevalence of MR bacteria like E. coli, shiga toxin producing E. coli, even salmonella or campylobacter is reduced or, uh, or, or yeah, reduced in organic dairy farms. Okay. Um, however, even though organic dairy farms do not use antibiotics, but when, we, when, 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 the, when, when they did this study, they found that there are certain bacteria that are resistant. So we are not so sure, even though they stopped the use of antibiotics. So what would be the factor that, that play in the long-term persistence of these bacteria? So the question here is that, should we remove antibiotics from animal production? 100%. So the, the answer is that it depends. If we are not using antibiotics, what happens if the animal gets sick? Okay, so that's the questions that should, I mean, we should ask ourselves. Um, and what about the mastitis treatment and AMR? Of course, the, uh, uh, the intramembrane infusion of penicillin, this is the very first drug to treat mastitis, which was, dis uh, which is devel which was developed in the mid 1940s. Uh, and they have seen uh, penicillin resistant staph aureus in France and in England uh, between 20, uh, 20, uh, 2002 to 2004. Uh, and this streptococcus, so because we know that staph aureus and streptococcus are the major agent causing mastitis. So they have seen uh, resistance uh, towards erythromycin and tetracycline as well. However, based on this study here, um, there's no indication of increased resistance among mastitis clinical isolates for antimicrobial use commonly to treat mastitis. So they are saying that it's not really a problem uh, if you talk about mastitis treatment with AMR, okay? But how true is this? We are not so sure. Uh, and if we were to compare between the beef, dairy, and feedlot, okay? Uh, they, 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 they mentioned that the Salmonella enterica serova Dublin uh, isolates uh, from the dairy calves were likely to be more resistant to many antimicrobials. Okay, because we know that dairy calves, they are kept intensively, but with beef calves, they are letting the calves uh, graze outside. Okay, uh, and because of the feedlot, the animal is crammed in one place altogether. So because of this high density, there's always a need to use antibiotics. Uh, and the widespread of uh, anti uh, the use uh, of antimicrobials uh, could cause the significant proportion of the bacteria isolates susceptible to antimicrobials tested. So it's not really a problem, actually. So what would be the take-home messages? We as the vets, I mean, you guys as the vet students, so it's actually our responsibility to advise our farmers uh, that preventive medicine is uh, very important. Uh, the herd health programs is very important. So if there is a vaccine, so you may want to uh, advise the farmer to take vaccines, to, um, uh, to, to apply some sort of the farm biosecurity to make sure that nutrition is good uh, and treat sick animals appropriately. Okay, because not all diseases should be treated with antibiotics. Some, is, uh, some diseases are caused by viruses, so you don't need antibiotics. And of course, record keeping is very crucial. I'm sure that a lot of our smallholder farmers, they don't have uh, the capability to record, uh, to, to, to keep records. Uh, so it's a bit of a problem there. And of course, we administer antibiotics based on the prescription. We follow the dosage, make sure that we follow the dosage, we make sure we follow the withdrawal period and avoid, of course, uh, avoid uh, over and under dosage use of antibiotics. So that's, that would be the, 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 the first, I, I guess, um, I'm not really sure, Dr. Daddy, if you would like to open for Q&A or should I just proceed with the second part?
I don't know where the the best. Do you like continue or you can? I discuss? can continue uh, or we can just open. Uh, if there's any question, I will entertain later. That will be okay as well. I think. I think is many students are still thinking of something. Okay. Then I think of oh, please continue in the second part, right. and then one well, again, please slowly. Okay. Because sure. many Indonesian is now many of the English, so please slowly. Ah, okay, okay, okay. all right. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. no problem. Okay, right. So moving on, we've talked about the uh, AMR uh, in the first part. So as a whole, as a general, like global problem, one half approach, etc. Uh, so we come to the second part. We will talking about dermatitis and AMR. So I'm not really sure like how many of you are final year students because I think from UPM I've invited the fourth year and the final year students. I'm not really sure from Ailanga, uh, which year are you in? But uh, it doesn't matter. All right. So uh, mastitis, uh, of course, mastitis is actually inflammation of the memory gland, okay? Coming from the word itis. So itis here means inflammation, okay? Must mean a memory gland. So the cause of mastitis is obviously commonly caused by bacteria and the rest would be fungus or even yeast, okay? So um, it's very simple. I mean, uh, if we were to define it's very simple. However, mastitis is a very complex disease. Okay, so what happened in mastitis is we can see abnormalities in the milk. Okay, so if there's only abnormalities in the milk, we call it as mild mastitis. Okay, however, if you can see uh, abnormalities on the memory gland, we call it as moderate. So if there's two clinical signs, milk and the memory gland abnormalities. So we can see that we can say that it's actually moderate mastitis. Or, okay, uh, but, but these two here, we can we, we term it as non-severe clinical mastitis. All right. Okay, just bear in mind in, in that in that sense. Or we can also have cows which are sick. Okay. The cow might be having fever, uh, not able to eat properly, in appetites, might be dehydrated. So if the cow is also sick, we call it as severe, okay? Uh, and and, and if, if the cow is also, okay, hold on. If the cow is also severe, sorry, you cannot. Okay, so if, if this is happening, so we can call this as severe clinical mastitis because the cow is also sick. All right, so this is just to show you like what would be the, the clinical signs uh, of mastitis. So we can observe there's redness, there's heat uh, or warm, there's pain, swelling, discoloration uh, of the memory gland. Okay, as we can actually see in this picture here, it's very swell, uh, uh, swollen, okay, Red, uh, reddening a bit. Okay, uh, this is a picture of a goat, of a doe, okay. Same here, swelling and redness. Uh, and this is a case of gangrenous mastitis uh, in which that the tissue, uh, tissue uh, has become uh, discolored, turned into blackish in color. Okay. And this is an example, one, another example in the shape, okay. turning into gangrenous mastitis. So um, the milk abnormalities that can also be seen is uh, the presence of flakes. We have flakes and we have clots in the milk. And there's a discoloration, not so clear in this picture here, but usually the color would turn into reddish in color or maybe changes in consistency. Okay, so these are all the abnormalities that can be seen. So in order for you to detect flakes and clots in the milk, um, the best is if you can use like a black plate. Okay, if you can use the black plate, you will be able to observe uh, the presence of flakes and clots. Talking about the etiological agents, so, uh, I would like uh, I, I, I'm, the way that I I would like my students to know is that uh, there are different uh, four groups of uh, etiological agents. So the first is the contagious, the second is thick skin opportunistic, and then we have the environmental pathogens and the uncommon pathogens. Although these uncommon pathogens are less likely to cause mastitis, but it is also 
very important. You should know at least a few of them. Okay, so these are the examples of the contagious pathogen, the thick skin opportunistic, and also the environmental pathogens. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, I'm talking about this current trend on mastitis causing pathogen. Um, before 1980s, uh, we, we do get a lot of uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus agalacti causing mastitis. Okay, and uh, from there, uh, the treatment protocol has uh, have been uh, focusing on getting rid of these types of uh, anti uh, uh, bacteria, okay, Staph aureus and Streptococcus agalacti. And because they know that, okay, these two bacteria are the common ones, so they, they did something, obviously, they did something good. Uh, and after the 1980s, they have seen that there has been a reduce in the prevalence of both of these bacteria. What, what, what causing uh, major problems is that they found 30% uh, of the coliform. So before that, coliform is not one of the problems. Okay, but however, after 1980s, more and more of the coliform, for example, E. coli, more of the environmental streptococci um, uh, have become a major cause of mastitis. And surprisingly, about 30%, they don't have any growth when they culture the milk. Okay, so what about Staph aureus? Are they still be the main culprit to cause mastitis? Okay, so this is especially happening in developed countries. Okay, uh, but I, I'm sure that if uh, the, the similar study is being done in Malaysia or even in Indonesia, we still we do still get this Staphylococcus aureus. So we do still get Staphylococcus aureus, especially in the smallholder farms. So this is just to show you the graph. Okay, so most of the time, majority would get no growth. Okay, so this uh, represented like uh, different countries here. So most of them, no growth, followed by coliform, followed by environmental streptococci. Okay, Staph uh, aureus is, you know, but not as, uh, as, 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 in, uh, as high as this, uh, these two here. Okay, so the reason why we get this no growth. Why do you think we get no growth here? Okay, the reason why is that most of the time, uh, this 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 kind of cases is actually uh, chronic subclinical mastitis, meaning that they don't have any clinical signs, but it is chronic, meaning that there's a persistence of inflammation. So this type of inflammation, they are not able to get rid of this. Bacteria, so bacteria is still there causing problems, but they they, they do not receive like a, 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 a maximum limit to de, to be able to detect in the culture system. So that's why they don't get no growth. So I'm sure that I think many of you, uh, especially final year students, when you see when you when when you send in um, milk samples uh, diagnosed with uh, mastitis, so when the result come back from the lab you would not get any growth. So this is the reason. It's not that because there's no infection, there is infection, but the amount of bacteria is very low to be able to detect by the culture system, okay? And also the second uh, reason is that because most of the time it is caused by uh, coliforms, for example. I'm giving just one example here, coliforms. So we know that coliforms, they have a high rate of cure. Okay, meaning that uh, before the animals are able to show some clinical signs, they are able to get rid of these bacteria. So that's why um, you, you, you send in the samples. I mean, uh, after, after, after there's uh, actually a clinical signs observed. So when you send the samples, there's no growth because the immunity of the animal itself are able to get rid of this E. coli, for example. Okay, so that's actually a reason why you get no growth. So with mastitis, you should always ask yourself whether to treat with antibiotics or whether not to treat. So it depends on the prognosis and also on the treatment outcome. Okay, so it really, because, because it, uh, the, we, 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 
what we call that the prudent use a proper use of antibiotics is very important okay it's very important Revision, uh, is do not want uh, mastitis to uh, uh, in the case of mastitis uh, we are giving like any types of antibiotics so we do not want that okay um okay Right. So when you are saying that uh, when, 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 when we uh, talk about the prognosis is that we, uh, it depends on the virulence of the, fact, uh, of the bacteria itself. So this bacteria, this etiological agent, it has a different virulence factors. So they have the ability to infect at a different side of tissue. Okay. Uh, it, it has their own uh, characteristic. So depending on that, uh, you should be able to determine whether or not to treat mastitis, okay? And the second one is the treatment outcome. Most of the time, the farmers would depend on the milk abnormalities, okay? Because that's the easiest way. So if the animals have milk abnormalities, for example, clots, okay? Um, so they're saying that, okay, there's a need for us to give antibiotics. However, we have to bear in mind that that is not the best practice to do because we cannot, um, we, we, we cannot say that the clinical uh, signs would be the best indicator to determine whether or not to give antibiotics. Okay. Second is that if you have uh, start with, let's say you start with antibiotic A for this mastitis case, all right, and you have observed that, okay, within the day six, it is not okay. The cow is still not okay. And then you decide to change the antibiotic. So this is not the best practice. Okay, so this is not the best practice. Please do not change antibiotics unnecessarily. All right, because it's very important. So the best thing to do here is that you should be able to collect the milk, send it to the lab, and then from the results, you have to assess whether or not to treat with antibiotics or not okay so these are the guidelines if you decide to give antibiotics to treat mastitis so you have to comply to these guidelines okay so avoid extra label use what does it mean by extra label use meaning that for example most of the intramembrane infusion is meant for staph aureus okay uh, but you have a case of mastitis caused by Klebsiella, for example. Uh, so, like it or not, uh, you still, you, you, okay, uh, under your judgment, you say that, okay, I think I need to give antibiotics for this Klebsiella causing mastitis. So, you're, 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 you're choosing penicillin, for example. So, the use of penicillin, uh, although it is not meant to be used for Klebsiella, you still use it under your jurisdiction. So this is called as extra label use of antibiotics. Okay, all right. And second is try to use the narrow spectrum antibiotic. You know that antibiotic can be broad spectrum or it can be narrow spectrum. So please use whenever feasible, use narrow spectrum antibiotic. And also use the antibiotic as short as possible. Okay, do not extend. Uh, you, you have to comply with the uh, the, the instructions when, uh, when, when giving the antibiotics. And of course, to identify the cow level factors, this is when you have to know uh, the history of the animals. If the animal is healthy, is not uh, old, uh, is, is not like very old cows, uh, is not having like a ketosis or any other diseases. So you may want to consider whether or not, because you have to make sure the immunity of the cow is good, okay? Because one, one function or one objective to give antibiotics is uh, just to, 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 to enhance the uh, clearance of the bacteria because the rest of it is being done by the immunity of the cow, right? So only like seven, there are nine uh, intramembrane, in, uh, intramembrane infusion. So only seven is being approved. Okay, so these are the list of antibiotics. Okay, um, so seven, uh, yeah, I think seven approved is meant for streptococci and staphylococci. Only two claim for E. coli. All right, so if the animal is having uh, septicemia, 
So you may want to consider to give uh, systemic antibiotics, for example, like cefiofur. Okay, parental, parental, meaning it can be uh, uh, given uh, IM, for example, okay, in the septicemic cows. Okay, we've talked about non-severe clinical mastitis before, in which that the cow only have abnormalities in the milk and also abnormalities in the mammary gland. So what you can actually do, if the cow is infected with non-severe clinical mastitis, you would need to assess the cow, okay? So uh, you have to identify the cows that may not be responsive, okay? By having this watchful waiting for four to six days, okay? Just watch this, this, this cows, okay? Uh, and if the milk returns to normal by day six onwards, so you may want to segregate the cow. Okay, try to segregate the cow. At this stage, you do not give antibiotics yet. All right, so you segregate the cow, meaning that this cow here still have mm -hmm. high somatic cells. Okay, um, and then if this cow has received many antibiotics, for example, so it is wise if you can just dry off the affected quarter, meaning that you do not want to use that memory gland for milking, which is permanent dry off, okay? Uh, and if the cows are diagnosed with mycoplasma bovis uh, or even staph aureus, so you might want to consider to cull the cows. So these are all the, um, the, the, the assessment of how you are going to uh, uh, decide whether to treat or not to treat. Okay, and of course, the best thing is actually to send the milk samples for uh, culture, okay? Because two-thirds of the antibiotics are of no or limited lim benefit to the cow. Even if you give antibiotics, it would not, it would not do any good, okay? Uh, I mean, in, in return, you, 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 you would need to increase the cost because you are using antibiotics. And yeah, because of the, uh, the cost to, 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 to send samples for the lab. So all, everything is actually uh, 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 incur some cost uh, to these mastitis problems. So if it is not feasible to do culture, okay? So what you can actually do is maybe you can try giving antibiotics, but only short duration. You do not use any parenteral antibiotics. You can just use the intramammary infusion. Okay, always apply. Try to the, the best way is actually to apply the culture-based treatment. So meaning that um, send the samples to the lab, and then you will get the result. And then you have this antibiotic sensitivity test result. So based on that, you you should be able to determine whether or not to treat with um, antibiotics or not. And of course, to ensure a good immune response in the cows. All right. So what would be the take home messages? So um, yeah, appropriate use of antimicrobials is very important, okay? Because like it or not, we still depend on the antibiotics to improve the animal well-being as well as the dairy farm sustainability. And make sure many cases of the non-severe clinical mastitis would not benefit from the antibiotics treatment, okay? So mostly in intensively hurts or intensive system, uh, you often get culture negative or you would often get pathogens with high rate of spontaneous cure, for example, E. coli or coliforms. Okay, always encourage the farmers to do culture or even review the medical history of the cows. So if it's not feasible, if the farmers do not have money to send samples to the lab, so you can perhaps use the narrow spectrum of drug only for short duration. All right, so I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I now pass uh, to Dr. Dadi. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Rosai and Mansur. So I will try to resume about your lecture for students, so maybe I use the Indonesian language. So, so first is, saya resum dari Dr. Rosayan Mansur is bahwa 
jenis antibiotik resisten itu bagi dokter hewan bukan hanya masalah pada hewan, tetapi juga pada masalah ke manusia. Kenapa? Karena kalau resisten yang terjadi pada hewan, dia bisa mencemari food dan juga environment. Nanti akan menghasil, menimbulkan problem infeksi yang sulit diobati. Nah, kasus antibiotik resisten ini ini terkait erat juga dengan MDGs apa Millennium Development Goal yang sudah disepakati yang juga dipanu oleh pemerintah Indonesia. Mungkin MDGs ini lebih banyak pada bidang kedokteran. Kalau dokter hewan mungkin belum begitu ini. Nah, era antibiotik itu juga dulu gencar atau era keemasan dan ada penurunan karena banyak produsen tidak mau mendevelop antibiotik generasi yang baru karena mungkin mahal, nggak laku dan sebagainya. Ini lalu ada ada MDR, ada XDR, ada PDR ini untuk mengelompokkan seberapa parah terjadinya resisten antibiotik resisten. Bagaimana bisa berbahaya bahwa bakteri yang sudah resisten ini membawa gen yang bisa menular pada bakteri lain dan bakteri lain bisa transmit ke bakteri yang berbahaya bagi manusia. Jadi antibiotik resisten itu bukan hanya berbahaya bagi hewan, tapi bisa sampai ke manusia. Lalu ini beberapa challenge antibiotik. Tantangannya adalah bagaimana mentraining pegawai di tingkat kesehatan, mungkin juga training untuk bidang vet karena di Indonesia problemnya adalah kompleks sekali di mana peternakan itu di desa perguruan tingginya di kota sehingga kalau mau mengini juga ada ada halangan yang cukup behave barrier is more typical completely in the pandemic era is we cannot to come to village and And so. Mungkin juga kita perlu membuat guideline untuk antibiotik use pada veterinerian, selain juga untuk meningkatkan awareness uh, apa, bahwa peternak untuk bisa. Nah, this is the the profile in Indonesia. Most use I think it's mostly used the antibiotic in Indonesia is the chicken. Definitely the conventional chicken because the uh, apa yang peternakan ayam negeri yang kalau istilah di sini itu intensif, waktunya pendek, jadi umumnya banyak menggunakan antibiotik. Walaupun pemerintah sudah melarang kita tidak tahu seberapa efektif pelarangan ini untuk dilaksanakan. Tetapi kalau pada hewan besar, setahu saya tidak banyak menggunakan antibiotik. Kenapa? Karena harga antibiotik di Indonesia mahal. Sedang harga, harga produk itu tidak begitu mahal. Oke? Okay? Lalu di Indonesia juga ini 2781 ini saya kira yang banyak menggunakan adalah peternakan ayam. Why? Because peternakan ayam yang intensif mereka banyak mendapat 
apa ya promosi obat-obatan yang gencar sedang yang uh, peternakan ayam yang ekstensif itu karena sedikit saya yakin jarang sekali didatangi karena itu sangat tidak efisien jadi many saya kira banyak penelitian tentang residu antibiotik itu terutama pada daging ayam broiler kalaupun monitoring ya kita mungkin belum mempunyai sistem monitoring yang bagus nah pada dairy industry itu mostly Indonesia have the KUD so farmer is not not directly with a veterinarian or give the antibiotic the KUD is control for everything so Saya lihat problemnya di KUD adalah mereka selalu menguji pada lima, empat, yang kadang ditambah jadi satu. Jadi uji alkohol, uji lemak, uji didih, dan satu lagi reduktase. Jadi kalau peternaknya belum tahu masitis, dia terjaring oleh uji alkohol sehingga ditolak. Kalau reduktasenya jelek, Dokter hewannya juga mulai mulai care ini apa dan sebagainya. Nah ini saya dapat info karena mayoritas produksi susu Indonesia itu pergi ke industri pengolah susu, misalnya Nestle. Nah Nestle mau memasukkan residu antibiotik sebagai salah satu poin untuk harga susu. Jadi we Now under pressure, but the good pressure to be uh, lower reduced. So uh, the veterinarian and the KUD must think how to take at the cure or treatment of the disease. So the problem I think is Indonesia how to support them. That's uh, another problem. Okay, jadi. Dokter Rosean juga menyampaikan sekarang sudah mulai ada konvensional dan organik dari farm. Jadi konvensional itu yang sekarang di dunia yang konvensional itu adalah yang dulu kita anggap peternakan modern. Jadi peternakan modern seperti layer, seperti broiler itu diberi istilah konvensional. Sedang yang organik itu yang dianggap lebih advance meskipun di Indonesia masih kita di dianukan bahwa peternakan modern adalah peternakan yang intensif yang menggunakan segala ini dan sebagainya ini yang yang terjadi then how to reduce of the antibiotic use vaksin mungkin juga Nah, ini salah satu adalah biosecurity. So many ini untuk mahasiswa, many from us think if animal is animal. Jadi hewan itu tidak perlu misalnya mendapat air minum yang bagus, tidak perlu tempat yang bersih dan sebagainya. Ini saya kira pesan biosecurity sangat penting. Dan yang masalah adalah untuk mentrit hewan yang betul-betul sakit, saya kira kalau untuk peternakan sapi perah, dokter hewan sangat berperan. Recording dan ini. Jadi penggunaan obat harus berdasarkan resep. Nah ini maka bagi mahasiswa, bagi ini, resep membuat resep itu sangat penting kalau ini. Oke, okay, then the second is mastitis and antimicrobial resistant. So we clear Dr. Rosian what the mastitis, the cause is bacteria, fungi and then mastitis clinical abnormalities and then and so on. So In Indonesia, KUD always checking about the milk quality. 
and mostly Indonesia is linked to KUD. Do one is not easy to sell the fresh milk. And the second, we know is we not enough have the capability to treat the uh, dairy cattle. So the I think KUD is, is very important. And then the cow satip in the world is tapilo and strap before 1980, and then coliform, environment streptococcus, and other. But in Indonesia, we don't know what happened. We don't know exactly what happened. So we just start to know what happened and other. So I think the mastitis is already treatment and then prognosis and treatment, mostly in the veterinarian have the power in this because the farmer, they don't understand about the disease. So it depends on the uh, veterinarian. So this is already veterinarian have to take care of everything. But I think that's the most important is avoid extra label. So many, many people thing is uh, antibiotic for everything. That's the, and use narrow spectrum. That's also the problem because many people, they like to use the broad spectrum because not many thinking, just keep it. So now is one is, I know, use for a certain duration and now, okay. And the Terico might be okay. And then factor, responsive, I think, and then big farm is okay, but in the small farm in Indonesia, mostly they have very limited space. So keep it in the, in the cave, on, in the place, small place, and then not easy to, to segregate or spread it between sick and done. So this is, I think, our uh, homework for how to, to teach people to increase how to keep the... You know. I think that's appropriate antibiotic, how many cases, and then good culture piece, and then I think now the problem is how to support with the uh, laboratory activity from in the city going to the village where they very, very uh, need for this result. So now this, this big, I think the big problem is how we support uh, the veterinarian who work in the field. So that's, I think, I, I have resumed. So sorry if I have many mistakes or something. So now, I think we have the discussion time. And then in SMS submission, we have some of the, the question. So please, Dr. Rosa Ian Mansur, you, Mansur, you have to uh, you can Answer. know the, the, the question. I think the system is very nice. <laughs> okay. okay, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think in the chat box here, we have several questions. First from Irfan. Uh, Assalamualaikum and very good evening to Dr. Zaihan. I have two questions. First, how to monitor antibiotic in milk production and meat? Is there implementation has been done? If no, why there's no implementation has been done? Okay, um, I guess uh, in Malaysia, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, answering on behalf of Malaysia. Um, maybe Dr. Dadik will help me in um, Indonesian uh, part. Uh, I think and under the National Action Plan of AMR, uh, we do, uh, uh, what do we call that? We do have the surveillance of antibiotic residues and I guess uh, Indonesia has been uh, is doing the same thing, uh, in which that um, 
is actually integrated, is actually part of the uh, activity uh, whereby the antibiotic residues in meat, in milk, is being, uh, is being monitored. Okay, uh, how, um, I guess they have this like a data set or something like that. And it, this is actually being done in the, uh, in the national lab. Okay, uh, so yeah. I guess we do have that uh, surveillance on the antibiotic residues in the milk and also in the meat product. Uh, can you confirm on that, Dr. Dadi? Actually, it's, it's similar in Indonesia, right? We, you, you guys do have uh, surveillance of antibiotic residues. Yeah. Yeah, we do have. Okay, second is how to educate farmers, especially the smallholder farmers, to increase their awareness about AMR and the use of antibiotic in a good way. Okay, um, how to educate? I think um, this is actually like a, um, everyone's responsibility. Uh, we as vets uh, plays a very crucial uh, role in, uh, in making sure that farmers uh, at the very least understand uh, on the, 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 the good use of uh, antibiotics. Uh, I'm just sharing this. Um, in our faculty, uh, we do have this uh, program called Ladang Angkat in which that we, we have like uh, up to 20 smallholder farms. So comprises of, uh, uh, we do have dairies, we, we have cattle farm, we have goat farm and we have sheep farm. So, so this Ladang Angkat, we, we do have like an annual activity. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, one of the... Um, uh, program would uh, one of the activities will include like increasing the awareness uh, among these farmers on antibiotics, for example, or increase the awareness on AMR, for example. So we do have. I think it, that this should be done regularly. There should be uh, like a, I mean the the relationship between vets, faculties, hospital, vet hospital, vet clinics with farmers should be very good so that any information that we have should be able to be transferred to this group of farmers. So Dr. Dadi, any, anything, any activities to the farmers, maybe in Ailanga? Yeah, we have the activity, but not so, so um, many related in the, in the resistance or the this, but we start to do that. Even might be still not easy because, as you know, we stay in Surabaya, and then the dairy cattle is minimum is hundred kilometer. Oh. So very not easy. So I have the small. We start to walking is approximately one hundred fifty or something, and then the and the many of dairy cattle in Indonesia in the top of mountain. Oh, okay. Because the easy, the price of land is still, still low, mm -hmm. because mostly dairy cattle is concentrated in Java mm -hmm. due to the uh, labor, due to the technology or something. So government is focusing in Java, but in Java the land is increased expensive. Oh. They go to village then very far and not easy to, to find, to get to this area. That's okay, that's challenge. <laughs> not problem, but challenge. It's challenge, yeah. yeah. Challenge. <laughs> okay, all right. So we have second question from Rivati. Uh, more on opinions. So will good husbandry practices decrease AMR in farms? Of course. Uh, I guess if we have like a good husbandry practice, uh, we make sure that the, 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 the farm sanitation is being maintained, uh, practice like vaccination, uh, making sure good nutrition is being, um, is being um, uh, given to the animals. I guess that should be the best way in order for us to decrease the use of antibiotics, meaning that we, uh, we do not depend 100% uh, on the use of antibiotics. So I guess Prevention is better than cure, okay? So always, I cannot agree more on the uh, practice of the good husbandry, okay? Uh, and then we have 
another question from Dewa Ketut Melis. So which one this true antibacterial resistant or microorganism resistant to antibacterial? Bacterial resistant by mutation, transduction, transformation and conjugation, but not on antimicrobial. Okay. Uh, are you asking on the definition? I'm not really clear on this. Uh, I guess, okay, the, the, the only thing that we should understand here when we talk about antimicrobial resistance is the bacteria itself. So it is not about human, it's not about the animals, but it's about the bacteria itself that has become resistant to antibiotics because we know antibiotics is being used to uh, kill or control the growth of bacteria. Okay, so we use antibiotics to treat bacterial infection. So if the, anti, uh, if the bacteria has become resistant, so it means that the antibiotics has no longer effective in killing this bacteria. So we call that as the bacterial uh, bacteria resistant. So that bacteria has already resistant towards antibiotics. Okay, so you are correct. Uh, this mutation, transduction, transformation is actually the mechanism of how the bacteria can get the resistance. So these are all the mechanism. All right, I hope I answer your questions. Uh, and then last question from Laila. Assalamualaikum Dr. Razahem. Thank you for your great presentation. I want to know how severe is the incidence of AMR in Malaysia? Is it the same as in Indonesia? Uh, and we know that AMR is a problem that has been discussed for a long time, but until now, the issue is still our focus and attention. So in your opinion, what is the most effective solution that we can do to resolve the problems? Okay. Um, I guess the, the severity, the severity of AMR, if we were to compare between Malaysia and Indonesia, I guess we are on the same page here. Okay, uh, we, I think both of us, we, 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 we have only started our national action plan. We just started on the surveillance on the use of antibiotics, but we are moving. That's the very important thing. I mean, this problem cannot be solved within one night or within one day, okay? It's a very complex problem. So we need a, 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 like a collaborative uh, efforts from everyone. So it's not like a straightforward problem. Okay, the only vets are responsible for this, no. So we are responsible, the vets are responsible, the medical doctors are responsible, even the publics are responsible for this. Okay, so we are in this together. But at the very least, I'm seeing that both Malaysia and Indonesia are moving forward. In, 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 in yeah, I'm not saying that we have achieved like zero AMR. Uh, and, and the reason why, I guess it's still a problem. It is still a problem, especially in the hospitals with an osocomial infections. I mean, an osocomial infections means um, uh, if a person coming into hospital, okay, uh, due to different problems, but along the uh, during their hospitalization, so they will get another infection. So that is actually an osocomial infection, meaning that infection that they can get from the hospital itself. Okay, and most of the death could be contributed by AMR. Okay, the people are dying because of the bacterial infection. Okay, so if if this patient is having bacterial infection, for example, okay, this person is having septicemia. So doctors uh, is giving antibiotic A to treat septicemia, uh, septicemia. However, this antibiotic doesn't work. Okay. So because of the seriousness of septicemia, so death would occur, okay? So I guess this is a very serious problem, but the media, they, they won't show this to us. They won't actually tell, okay, this person is dying because of, of AMR. So they are not going to say that, okay? But we hope that it's our responsibility as vets, as the medical doctors, even as public, we are in this together. So we hope that, in the future, it would be reduced because it is expected, okay? Death due to AMR is expected to be high, even worse than cancer, even worse than traffic accidents. So you can actually see that AMR is a very serious um, issue. Okay, 
we have another questions from FPM Lokman. Okay. Uh, question, how can you explain that bacteria resistant to antibiotics can transmit to other bacteria? Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, there was transmission of antibiotic resistant bacteria to other healthy bacteria. Okay, so um, I'm not going to into detail because you need to go into like, I think, uh, what lecture? Uh, maybe uh, bacteriology uh, lecture on this. So uh, by right, they have the ability to transfer the gene. So these resistant bacteria, they have the gene called as resistance gene. So they are able to transfer this resistant genes to other bacteria. So this is something, um, something that is very, I mean, the bacteria is able to do that. So they are able to transfer the, the to other bacteria. Okay, so it's 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 possible to be that. All right. Any other questions? I think I've addressed. Everything, Dr. Dadik? Okay, thank you, Dr. Rosia. We wait, maybe some question. Oh, we have another from Dr. Sule. Okay. I think. So, so please, please, yeah. Okay, uh, surveillance program of MR in Malaysia. Any rules of your government about the use of antibiotics in human or animals? So far, I know the kinds of antibiotics used to treat should not be used. Okay, we, we do have the surveillance program uh, under the National Action Plan of AMR. Uh, the rules, um, the thing is that um, I've read somewhere in Indonesia, the use of vet drugs is controlled by the vet people. <laughs> However, for in our Malaysian side, the drugs are actually under uh, the Ministry of Health jurisdiction. So under Ministry of Health of Malaysia, we have uh, this uh, like a pharmacy. So this, this uh, division is actually regulating the, the, uh, the, the, the use of antibiotics, the import and export of these um, uh, drugs. Uh, concerning both in vets and as well as in the human sec uh, human health sector. Uh, of course, we do have uh, like uh, rules uh, saying that uh, this antibiotic shouldn't be used. As, uh, for example, colistin. Colistin shouldn't be used at all. It is banned 100%. Okay, so we do have like a list of antibiotics that shouldn't be used, especially as the growth promoters. Yeah, especially for the growth promoters. Um, however, I think the problem here is actually more like an enforcement, okay? Uh, because I'm not really sure what would be the condition in Indonesia, but in Malaysia, we public can get antibiotics online. So they are able to purchase antibiotics online from Shopee um, or, or from, yeah. I mean, people are selling antibiotics everywhere. So the only thing here is actually the enforcement of the law. The law is there, but the enforcement is not. I guess I'm not really sure what's what's wrong there. You know, I'm not really sure if the same happened in Indonesia, Dr. Dadi. Uh, I think we, we can get antibiotic everywhere, even in the yeah, small shop or something, they can sell antibiotic. That's mm -hmm. that's is very and then Many of the pharmacy they direct to to go to farmer. That's I think the problem. That's that's the similar problem that we are facing in Malaysia. So farmers they can get antibiotics everywhere without yeah. having us to advise the vets to advise. So the yeah. problems in Asia, I think. Okay. Any other yeah. questions? Okay, anybody still have the question? Okay, no? Okay, so thank you very much to Dr. Rosayan Mansour about your very, very good lecture. So I think we are Indonesian is have the follow the network. 
So if NACPER is become increase, Indonesia more easy to follow NACPER because when United States or Europe, that's far away. But Malaysia is close. So, and then, and Indonesian people, I think is, uh, we need to, <coughs> for me is like this, we have, okay, I have the, the looks. Pakistan and India, neighbor have problem. And then Israel and Palestine. And then North Korea, South Korea. I talk with Indonesia and Australia, also not good. So I hope Malaysia and Indonesia, we have good relationship and then we have the working together for this area. So I hope this is not end of our relation with the Dr. Sayan Mansur. But next, I think we need more, more tightly to collaborate. So yeah. I think if over pandemic, so welcome in Surabaya, or maybe if we have chance, I will, we will go to Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for your lecture. And once again, thank you, thank you very much. So we have to applause to Dr. Rosan Mansur. Thank you, Dr. Adi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So time back to Mr. Ceremony. So Dr. Dian, please, the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Dadi, for guiding this session. And thank you very much for the speakers for informative and insightful presentation. Uh, we want to give certificate as a reward to the speaker. Okay, uh, here is, uh, thank you, Dr. Ronald Zaihan for your willingness to give our event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, before closing, let's take a picture together. To all the participants, please turn on your video camera. Okay, uh, let's take a picture. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Okay, done. Uh, thank you very much. And finally, uh, we got the last, uh, we get to the last session in this event that is closing. On behalf uh, of the committee, we would like to thanks to the speaker for the informative and interesting presentation and all the participants for the participation. May that we have conducted today will be useful for all of us. Uh, once again, if there are any imperfections during the implementation of this event, we would like to apologize to everyone. Uh, let's close this event by saying hamdalah, alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Rozaihan. Nice uh, lecture for us. Okay, no problem. Thank you so yeah. much for inviting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, maybe uh, for next uh, time, we want to you to uh, give us lecture again. Okay. Yep. okay. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> So perhaps okay. the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has end, so perhaps we can, you know, I can go to Surabaya. And oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, of course. It's it's nice if uh, we can uh, directly meet mm. yeah. uh, each other. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. See you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank See you. Bye. See you. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. See you later. Okay. See you later. Thank you. Matunuan, Dokter Dadi, Dokter Sule, Dokter Dian, Dokter Dandi, Dokter Retno, Dokter Uci. Ya. Wiji, Matunuan. Terima kasih, tapi mohon maaf. Yeah. Tadi saya sudah ngutek-ngutek, nggak bisa bikin background. Tidak <laughs> apa-apa, Dokter. Ini <laughs> saya pikir ya sudahlah menemani pembicaraan. Uh. Tidak lupa, jam lebih nggak bisa. Nggak apa-apa, buat nama-nama dokter. Ini semua maaf. Ini buat nama-nama tidak wajib. Mohon maaf, sudah berusaha. Buat nama-nama dokter. Terima kasih banyak atas semua kerja keras kalian. Dan dan nanti Senin kita launching lagi yang Juli. Oke. Terima kasih ini kita semua kerja kerasnya. Oke, nanti kita kapan kita bisa bicarakan apa yang ke depan mau kita kerjakan. Oke, terima kasih ya. Sukses untuk yang muda-muda ini yang anu. Yang Banyuwangi tadi juga saya lihat nyampe juga. Oke. Terima dari Banyuwangi saya lihat.